It's a real honour to be here today to talk to you all. So thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come and listen to me. Um, today my presentation is going to, um, which is called Killing in the Name of, Exploring the Myths of Violent Extremism. So my aim today is to talk to you a little bit about violent extremism, but also to tell you a little bit about how I ended up at Macquarie University, so many miles away from where I come from in the United Kingdom. Before I tell you about myself, I just wanted to start by busting one of the key myths that is propagated about violent extremism in today's world. And so I've got a slide, and it's got a lot of pictures of different people. And the title of the slide says, who do you see? You see um, a white lady, a white man, a black man, a young boy, a young lady and another man. But what actually connects all of these different people? Why have I put them on this slide? These aren't all random individuals. The lady on the top left of the slide is named, her name is Bernadine Dawn. And she's an American citizen. And she's currently a professor of law at Chicago University. The person in the middle is Martin McGuinness. He's the former deputy first minister of Northern Ireland. The individual on your right was Nelson Mandela, the first president, black president of South Africa. The individual on your left, the boy, his name is Annie Somboli. He's an, a German-Iranian. The lady in the middle is Tashfeen Malik. She's another American citizen. And the man on your right is Anders Breivik, a Norwegian. Now the reason I've put all of these pictures together is because every single one of these individuals at some point in their life was classified by governments around the world as being a terrorist. Nelson Mandela, President of South Africa, was, as many of you might know, arrested and placed in solitary confinement for being a member, in fact the leader of the African National Congress, which at the time was classified as a terrorist organisation. This Irish minister, Martin McGuinness, was a former member of what's known as the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, who waged a violent war against Northern Ireland and Britain for many, many years, up until the late 1990s. Bernadine Dawn, the professor of law at a university in America, was an active member of the Weather, the Weather Underground Group, responsible for a number of bombings across America in the 1970s. She was arrested and placed in jail. Ali Somboli was motivated by anti-immigrant narratives in Germany, and he opened fire into a shopping centre and killed nine people. Whereas Tashfeen Malik carried out an attempted bombing in California. And Anders Breivik, a Norwegian, killed a number of different people through um, a shooting attack on an island and a bombing in the capital of Norway. Now why have I put these different people up here? That's because when many of us think about violent extremism and terrorism, this is what we think about. We think about suicide bombers. We think about Islamic State. We think about Islamist organizations, such as Al-Qaeda, and as I've noted, Islamic State. Now, it's not to say that the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda are not significant threats. And they do form part of much of my research and interest in understanding terrorism. But it's so important for us to remember that they're not the only terrorists out there and they'll not be the only terrorists in the future. Violent extremism is so much more than just an association with a specific group or a specific religion. And when we think about trying to understand what it means to become a violent extremist, 
what motivates individuals to give up their lives. It's really important for us to move beyond the stereotypes, not just to think about what's in the media, but also to think about the phenomenon that plagues a large part of the world and it is generated by a range of different groups. Violent extremists don't always look like what the media demonstrate and what's produced in the media in today's society. And so during this short presentation, I'm going to take you through a few things. I'm going to start off with my own personal journey, how I ended up here at Macquarie University. And then I'm going to look at two of the key myths that are perpetrated about violent extremists. The myth of madness and the myth of badness. I'm going to look at two of my current work projects and then I'll have time for any questions. So, how did I end up here at Macquarie University? Well, when I left school, I went to study anthropology, which is the study of culture. You can see on the cartoon, supposed tribal people hiding all of their modern equipment because the anthropologist is coming to study them. And I really enjoyed my degree in anthropology. And after studying, I went traveling for several years. I went to Southeast Asia and I went to the South Pacific. And I worked for one of my professors trying to understand how ecotourism, the phenomenon of ecotourism, was affecting remote communities in the island of Vanuatu. When I came back, I went to work and study in Belgium, in the capital, in Brussels. I worked for a French M minister of the European Parliament managing his <clears throat> social diary, and I did a master's in international relations. And then I went back to the United Kingdom, and I kind of was stuck. And I really wanted to do something that made a difference to the world, um, that made a difference. I wanted to be engaged in some sort of political process, but I really had no idea how to go about doing that. Um, and I kind of thought, well, what's an anthropologist going to do? And well, what can an anthropologist do? You know, it's not the most um, likely degree to lead to an obvious career, unless you want to be an anthropologist. And so then I was going through the job pages of a national newspaper, when I saw an advert by an organisation called Defence Science and Technology Labs, DSTL. The Australian equivalent is DSTO. And they were calling for anthropologists. Well, I can tell you that in all my life, I've never seen a job advert for an anthropologist. Um, and so immediately after phoning every anthropologist who was under work or had no job um, to raise their attention, I also applied for the job. And to my surprise, I, I was offered this role. And it led me into the world of defence. And never before that time had I thought about working for defence. I thought defence was all about you know, soldiers or um, the Air Force or, or the Navy. I kind of hadn't perce perceived a role for myself in defence. But so what does an anthropologist actually do for a defence organisation? Well, DSTL provides strategic advice and research to the Ministry of Defence. And so my first roles for the organisation were shaped by a diverse of long-term strategic planning. I was working on projects that were thinking about what should the UK's defence force look like at the time in 2020, which obviously ages me, um, as well as kind of short-term operational requirements shaped by the very new engagements by the armed forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. After a few years of working there, my mentor um, invited me to come and join him at an organisation called Defence Intelligence. Um, and I think as an aside, because this is a careers um, talk, I can't um, talk more highly about the, the role a mentor has had in my life. My mentor has helped um, shape my career, not through anything directly active that he's done himself, but more because he was able to help me think about what my, um, what my opportunities were, what my skills were. He could hold up a mirror and help me think about my weaknesses and how to improve them. Um, and also provided an extra pair of eyes to spot opportunities that I might have missed. 
Anyway, he recruited me into defense intelligence. And there I worked as part of a behavioral science team. So I worked with psychologists, geographers, economics graduates, um, sociologists, and myself, an anthropologist. And our role was to provide socio-psychological advice. So advice about what makes people do the behaviors that they do. How do people act and why do they act in those ways? And how does that impact military engagements, current military engagements and potential future military engagements? And in this role, I deployed to a number of um, overseas um, locations, including Afghanistan on a number of occasions. And working in Afghanistan, my role was to provide anthropological insight, cultural insight. And that led me to work with the UK ambassador, but also to work with people who were patrolling the streets. How should a commander understand the people that they're working with in Afghanistan in the specific area that I was located in Helmand province. What do, what are the consequences of tribal dynamics on engagements? And these were all the kinds of diverse questions that I was working um, towards finding answers to. Um, and as part of my role in Afghanistan, I really became interested in the phenomenon of suicide terrorism. Why were people willing to kill themselves in a really violent way? You know, in my past, I'd been really, really committed to lots of different issues. I really felt at the beginning of my career like I wanted to make a difference, but at no point had I ever been considering violence as a way in which to achieve difference? And why were these people perceiving that as a legitimate and justified option? But it wasn't just my work, it was also what was going on around me. I was living in the United Kingdom and on um, the 7th of July 2004, there was a a big bombing. Um, a number of individuals blew themselves up um, in the underground train system and also on a bus. And events like this really um, confronted me and I thought, you know, again, why is this occurring in the United Kingdom? I could kind of understand in Afghanistan in a conflict zone, but, but why is this happening here in, in London where I live? And that led me to um, a new job in the Home Office. The Home Office is Australian equivalent, it's probably the Attorney General's department. And there I was brought in to lead a team and we were trying to understand how the complexities of what makes individuals um, willing to associate and work with and perhaps be inspired by violent extremists, um, how this um, was different across different parts of the United Kingdom and how this, these differences shaped the approach is taken by government and local authorities to try and counter the risk and the threat. And now, working in the policy environment that I was working in, it is really exciting. You know, there's a real kind of motivation and um, energy about finding solutions in the here and now. You know, when a minister needs to do something, he doesn't want to be told, I'm doing this piece of research and I'm gonna have an answer for you possibly in two years' time. He wants to know, actually, can you give me the answer last week? And if you can't give me the answer last week, can you make sure that the answer only spans three sentences? Because I only have three sentences and I'll only have five minutes to present to the Prime Minister. And that's really exciting. Um, and it's really um, inspirational to be part of a team that works to such tight deadlines. But at the same time, I was really interested in exploring the issues that I've talked about in more depth. I really wanted to have the time and the space to think through these societal concerns in more depth. Because as I was working in the policy environment, I was seeing that one of the key issues that we were facing was that there just wasn't enough knowledge. There wasn't enough insight. There was almost no research, very little data. And so the solutions that we were 
coming up with, it wasn't that they were wrong, but they could have been so much better if we'd have known more and understood more. And so when I had the opportunity to come and work as a researcher and as a lecturer at Macquarie University, obviously the sunshine did play a small factor in that. So those of you who've ever been to the United Kingdom will know that it rains and it's quite cold a lot of the time. But also it was about having some space to think through more carefully, to generate the data, to have some time to think about the problems and to explore them in more depth so that those who were remaining in the policy world had better information and better understanding. And so that is how I ended up here at Macquarie University. And so what do I actually mean by violent extremism? Well, because this is a complex social phenomenon, there is no unified definition. You can look anywhere in the world and you'll see probably over 200 definitions of the same words. Violent extremism is often defined by politics, people in power. So for example, Nelson Mandela was called a terrorist. People didn't like what he was representing in the 1950s and 60s, 70s and 80s. And so they called him a terrorist. It's a very powerful world, word. And it pushes someone to the extreme. If you're a terrorist, you're extreme, your views are unacceptable. Now the definition I use in my work is that used by the Australian government because I am within the Australian um, academic space. And also I like this definition because it's very broad, it's very um, loose and it's not very prescriptive. So it's harder to kind of say, well, I'm going to marginalise you because I just don't like your views. And so you can see on the screen that the definition I've taken is from Living Safe Together and it says that violent extremism refers to the beliefs and actions of people who support the use of ideologically motivated violence to achieve a range of views. And that's really important because my research is not interested in the person that wakes up in the morning, gets a gun and goes and shoots lots of people. That does happen. We see that happening um, across the world, particularly in America. I'm interested in the individual who, after some time, perhaps takes a gun and goes out and shoots a lot of people, but links that act to something greater than themselves. Radical ideological beliefs, political beliefs, economic beliefs, religious beliefs. It's the link between action and idea that turns the act into something about violent extremism rather than just violence. And at the same time, it's really important here to remember that holding an extreme view that people in society are uncomfortable with does not make you a violent extremist. Lots of people all around the world hold really extreme and radical views. That's not necessarily a problem. The problem comes when that view is put together with a perspective that says the only way we can achieve that view is through violence. And then the view seeks to justify, motivate, and accept violence as a way forward. Now, perhaps one of the greatest myths of violent extremism is that all violent extremists are mad. You will have all seen the newspaper reporting, and you've probably, we've all thought it ourselves, my gosh, if you're going to kill yourself for a cause, you must be mad. You must be mentally insane. And indeed, lots of academics used to believe that anybody who is a violent extremist must be mad. You can see the quote taken from William Lecoeur, who is one of the leading, was one of the leading terrorist um, scholars in the kind of early 1990s. However, men mental illness alone simply doesn't explain violent extremism. Violent extremists as mad individuals has really taken hold again because of this phenomenon of the lone wolf. You can see um, this newspaper article taken after the Sydney siege, where the individual carried it out was claimed to be mad and weak and alone. And mental illness is so frequently cited in numerous attacks that have occurred over the past, in the past year. However, all of the research that has been carried out 
looking at the psychiatric history of people engaging in violent extremism has shown that very few of these individuals have diagnosable psychiatric disorders. Most people who engage in violent extremist behavior, suicide bombing, shootings, etc., show no clinical signs of any mental illness. They are rational, sane. They're like us, mentally healthy. Now, it's really important that we don't conflate temperament and psychology with clinical mental illness. They're two very different things. An individual might come from a background where violence is, domestic violence is, is, is part and parcel of their um, experience, and that might shape their understanding around violence. But that still doesn't make the individual mentally ins ins insane. And what's really interesting is when you look at people who have been diagnosed with a mental illness, so Anders Breivik, the individual responsible for the attacks in Norway. Now he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenic, schizophrenia, but at the same time he was taken to court and he was found guilty. And in order to be found guilty, he then had to be found mentally stable. And so one of the academics who's looking at this issue highlights the political ramifications of mental illness and the importance of, of how it's used politically to kind of undermine violent extremists. Well, we don't have to worry about them because they're all mad, is the kind of response that that creates. But that's really dangerous. And also it plays into the hands of violent extremists. There's nothing we can do about them because they're all mentally insane. No, actually, these are people who are rational, logical human beings who've made a series of decisions, consciously and unconsciously, that have led them to this point in time. And we can do something about it, and we can understand them. And even if they do exhibit signs of mental illness, that mental illness in no way justifies or even motivates the violent extremist action. Now, the second thing that I want to confront is badness. The other thing that people describe violent extremists as of being bad, they're really evil, they're awful. Now, the act of violent extremism is awful. It is terrorizing because that's the point of it. If it wasn't terrorizing, and if it didn't make people fearful, it wouldn't be very effective as a tool. Now, Stanley Milgram was a psychologist, and in the 1960s, he carried out a number of really interesting experiments. One in particular is about obedience. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work, but what he did was he asked volunteers to come into a room, one at a time, and behind a screen, was another volunteer attached to lots of nodes and kind of, if you think about hospital kind of um, like points. And these points were attached to a machine that you can see in the picture that delivered an electric shock to the person behind the screen. Stanley Milgram would come in and ask the volunteer a number of questions behind the screen and the person he brought in to do the experiment, he would send, then say to that person he brought into the experiment, I want you to ask the person behind the screen a question. If the person behind the screen gets the question wrong, you need to give them an electric shock. If they get the next question wrong, you need to give them a greater electric shock. And so on and so forth. And every time the person behind the screen gets the question wrong, you're going to increase the amount of shock you give the person. Now, just to ease your minds, unbeknownst to the volunteer, the individual behind the screen wasn't actually attached to the electric shock machine. It was an experiment. But the person asking the questions didn't know that. 65% of all the people brought in to that room turned the machine up so high that they killed 
in inverted commas, the person behind the screen. The person behind the screen got every single question wrong, and so they had to thought they were, the, the, the person asking the questions put up the machine higher and higher and higher until they delivered an electric shock that was so much, it killed the volunteer behind the screen. 65% of people, that's three, over three quarters of all of us, you know, look around your room, think that three quarters of you would probably, if you did this experiment, end up killing that individual. And that's really powerful and it really challenges how we understand what's going on. The act of violent extremism is terrorizing and is bad. But there are so many things at play that lead an individual to that point that it's not enough just to say that person is evil. Because that doesn't help us think about what brought them there and what we could do to counter that. The act is evil, but the individual at one point in their life was just like you and I. Just like you and I could potentially be one of those individuals that turned the electric shock dial all the way up to severe danger. Um, and I am running out of time. Um, very quickly, this slide talks about the phenomenon of Western foreign fighters, often called bad or evil. But actually what we see, one of the principal motivations behind this are things like social networks. Individuals who have joined and gone to fight talk about finding meaning, wanting to do something, have agency. There are a whole series of sociological and psychological, economic, um, societal phenomenon at play here. It's not enough to say that they're mad or bad. And so much of my work is thinking about the consequences of the complexity that leads people to become violent extremists. Um, we saw that in the countering violent extremism space, it's really important to understand the complexity of the process of becoming a violent extremist. And we also saw how resilient New South Wales society is in light of the Sydney siege. The Our Ride With You campaign demonstrating the strength of community relations. And this is important because we know that societal resilience can help prevent of violent extremism. And so one of my projects was to work with the Department of Premier and Cabinet and Multicultural New South Wales to develop a grants program to support this whole of society resilience um, phenomenon. And the project that we developed was called Compact and that's currently running. There's 14 different projects that are funded and they're all about developing partnerships. Partnerships that allow for awareness to be raised, to empower young people, really importantly to address global issues, to allow people to talk about these in open spaces and not fear that they're going to be labelled in some way that's derogatory to themselves. And my other piece of work is really thinking about social media. What's the role that social media plays in helping people move towards violent extremism. People often say, oh, you know, they're playing video games that are really violent, and then they end up being violent. But actually, we know that it's really more complicated than that. We know that we're actually all prosumers. It's not that somebody produces social media and we simply consume it. It's so much more dynamic. It's so much more involved and it's so much more complex. And how can we understand that complexity when we're thinking about the role that social media plays in turning people towards and into violent extremism and therefore how we could potentially counter that? And this is a really exciting um, space to work in. Um, for me, it helps address really important things that affect all of us on a day-to-day -day life. You know, all of us are affected by violent extremism. And so to me, to be able to do research in an area that contributes to better understandings of that, so that when governments, local authorities, 
schools, community groups, try to engage and build the types of relationships and spaces that can foster forces to work against violent extremism. That to me is an incredibly exciting and dynamic space to be part of. And so um, I just wanted to end very quickly with um, this optical illusion. Because for me, this really sums up the work that I have done in the past in government and the work that I'm doing now. You know, in front of you is an optical illusion. Some of you will see a young lady. And some of you will see an old lady. Some of you will see both. And my work's really about that. It's about helping people see both and then challenge, challenge, um, channeling the fact that you can now see complexity and using that understanding and that visual of complexity to help us um, counter things that in society are really complex and difficult and have a security threat to each and every one of us. Thank you. And so now, um, that was a very brief run through. Um, I'm happy to take any questions any of you have. And just really want to reiterate that there's no such thing as a stupid question. There's only a stupid answer. So, so please, any questions at all. So one of the really interesting things about an optical illusion is that once you've seen those different images, you can never go back to seeing the single. Now, every time you look at that image, you're going to see both the old lady and the young lady at the same time. And one of the things that we know about violent extremism is that a lot of the ideologies that are motivating violent extremists are very singular. They only have a single perspective. And we know that one of the ways in which we can counter those single perspectives is by getting people to understand that there's more than one perspective in the world that it's perfectly acceptable to hold one perspective, but that not everybody's going to have that same perspective. Not everybody's going to see just the young lady. Some people are going to see just the old lady and some people are going to see both. And how do we challenge, channel that energy? How do we channel and those diverse perspectives into something that is good for all of us, not just for one of us? I'm not a lawyer, um, but if you are diagnosed mentally um, insane um, or with a mental illness, you still have to be held. You still have to be held rational at the point in time of trial. You have trial. So when they tried Anders Breivik, they had to demonstrate. The prosecution had to demonstrate that when he was planning the attack, he wasn't going through um, a bipolar episode or an incident of. Um, um, schizophrenia and so he was effectively rational um, at the time of planning and perpetrating the attack so even though he was paranoid schizophrenic that mental illness didn't impede his ability to know that he was going to carry out an attack that was going to kill people and one of the ways that the prosecution showed that was that he not only carried out an attack but he carried out the attack to bring an awareness to a manifesto, I think um, 960 something pages long, that he then published online. So as he was carrying out the bombings and the shootings, the, his manifesto was published online and it explained and justified why he was carrying out those reasons, that those attacks. And so he was said, so the court upheld the fact that while he did have this clinical illness, at the time of carrying out the attack, he was um, sane. Um, I think that in the past, there hasn't really been enough as a, of appreciation of the complexity. And at a federal level, sometimes the desire to do something outweighs the um, the time needed to appreciate the complexity. I think that across the states, particularly in New South Wales and Victoria, 
at the state level, there has been a real appreciation of the complexity and a lot of effort is being made to ensure that policies and initiatives um, take on board this complexity. But at the federal level, this can be a lot harder. Governments need to have messaging and programs that kind of cover the whole of Australia. And we know that violent extremism is often shaped by local issues. And it's, so it's really hard for federal governments. But I do think federal governments do need to work harder at capturing um, the complexity and using their policies to better appreciate um, the complexity, particularly where I'm from in the United Kingdom. Initial attempts to counter violent extremism by the British government were really, really bad and did a lot of damage to community relationships um, because they didn't appreciate the complexity, um, the influence of local issues, the influence of foreign policy. Um, so no, I don't think governments are always very good at appreciating the complexity. And that's why I'd encourage you all to think about careers in this space because one of the ways that we can educate the government is through our research and through our own knowledge working for those governments. It would be great to use the media for good. And you know, I think that there are options to put out good news stories. Um, but I think we also have to be aware that the media, the broadsheet media and television media, less so social media, um, are driven by profit. And bad news stories sell much better than good news stories. Um, and so while we do, in my old role in the United Kingdom, we did a lot of work in terms of educating the media. Um, at the end of the day, they are caught in this strange, strange space where a lot of them do have an appreciation of complexity and some reporters do really amazing and interesting stuff out, you know, and really try to s demonstrate the complexity. But when there's an attack, it's just so easy to go back to those stereotypes, um, go back to those kind of myths, because also um, that sells a lot of papers and sells kind of TV space. And so there is this, this difficult and challenging um, relationship between the research community, the policy community and the, and the media community. And interest in people. I think that's the biggest one. If you're really interested in people and the relationships between people, that is at a definite starting point. And I guess my pathway was so diverse. You could go and study security studies, you could study criminology, you could study anthropology, sociology, economics, law, um, cyber security, um, information technology. I mean, there's so many different and diverse pathways. More and more the policy world. So if you wanted to ultimately say, go and work for New South Wales government, or the Attorney General's office, or DFAT, they're looking for people who have critical thinking skills. So they're not just looking for a graduate from politics or international relations. They're looking for people who have the ability to think critically about the problems and think critically about the world. Um, so I've worked in the past with people who've come up through the police force, who have excellent experience um, in understanding people, in understanding relationships, because that's part and parcel of being a police person, police officer. But at the same time, I've worked with lawyers, I've worked with computer specialists, I've done a lot of work with really technical individuals who've only studied IT and who are really interested in using IT to think about ways in which we can better understand the relationships people have in social media. Um, so I don't think there's any one specific pathway. I think actually, um, it's more about doing something that really interests you in terms of further study and thinking about using that to um, then get a pathway perhaps into government or with an, um, a, an NGO, a non-governmental organisation, um, with um, local government, with the police, with defence. I mean, to be honest, there's so many different pathways that can bring you to where I am now, if that's what interests you. But ultimately, you need to be driven by an interest in the relationships between people 
and want to kind of pursue that in your further education and then in your career. Um, I'd say that um, there are a number of um, internships, so our at security studies um, and criminology, if you do the undergraduate unit, you do a PACE unit, and if you do our postgraduate unit, we do internship programs. So we have students that work for KPMG, um, Telstra, um, local authority, and because Telstra are all about security and understanding security, uh, particularly in the online space. KPMG provide a lot of advice at a, at a strategic level. Um, there's so many different pathways that are on offer to people who are interested in this subject. Um, I, I'd like there to be a prescriptive one, but luck, and also at the same time, it's great that there isn't. You know, um, if you work, if you're interested in law, you know, people engage in this space through legal profession as well. We live in a democracy, and part of, part of democracy back all the way back to the social contract, um, back in the kind of you know, 16th, 17th century, is this notion of, that has developed over time of freedom of speech, freedom of expression. So for me, radical views have a perfectly acceptable space in our society. You know, some views that are radical become less radical over time. You know, Nelson Mandela fighting for um, equality in South Africa um, was really radical back in the day, but that notion is no longer that radical to us. Um, my problem is not, I don't think society should have a problem with radical views. And I think society at the moment sometimes does. It doesn't know how to allow people to express those radical views. It doesn't give them the space to explore the ramifications of radical ideas. Um, radical ideas don't always lead to violence um, and often don't lead to violence, I should say. It's really only in very few occasions do radical ideas um, lead to and are coupled with violence. And if that violence is not part of the radical kind of milieu, then I would say that they held an important part of um, a democratic environment. Yes. You know, in my very first interview in um, defence at DSTL, my um, interviewer, then boss, asked me whether I believed in absolute truth or subjective truth. And, and, I, and I said, I believe in subjective truth. I think you can look at what you can understand. You can see what's around you. You can gain your understandings and your experience. And you can make a decision at that point based on what you know and what you understand. Now, it's your responsibility to make sure that that understanding is, ho is ho as holistic and interconnected as possible, and so not singular. And then you might be found, later find additional information that changes that perspective. That doesn't say that what you've believed in the past was not true. At that time, you made a judgment that was true. Now, yeah, absolutely, terrorism is often claimed to be a perspective. But, however, I guess the critical difference, there's a difference between holding a view that is an extreme, holding a view that sits outside of what is acceptable. And as I said before, that shouldn't be a problem. The problem comes is when the only way to achieve that view is through violence. If you are part and parcel of a narrative that says, well, you have all of these views that are quite radical, and now, in order to enact them, you have to go and kill people, then I would say that is what makes the difference between people who hold radical ideas that are completely different to me and that I perhaps really disagree with, and a terrorist. 